before we were born, you're looking at darkness. Sound is the first sense that gets plugged in. Six months, seven months into the womb, it's hearing the mother's heartbeat, it's hearing her breathing, it's hearing dad shouting from the garage. It's making sense of the world. You have emerged into a kind of consciousness using only sound. And then you're born. Sound affects us in a deeper way almost than, than image does. It goes deeper. we're naturally, seemingly oblivious to that. Film sound is an illusionary art, as if you're just hearing the natural sounds happening in the world on screen. It's subliminal, and it's a purely emotional way of thinking about a movie. <laughs> It's stealthy sound work. It's flying under the radar. It's understated. But what sound adds to the picture is so exhilarating that I just was hooked and pretty much never looked back. When you're depressed, it's not working, and then the sound design comes in. The feeling of scale that the sound was giving. And I think the sound, in, in many ways, is more tied to imagination. If you're born to be artistic, uh, then sound's gonna be part of the deal. It's part of being human. No, movies sight and sound. You only express it with sight and sound. People always talk about the look of a film. They don't talk so much about uh, the sound of a film but it's equally important, sometimes more important. I am not an animal! The point is to convey an emotion. Everything is in service of that. And sound is half of the experience. I've always been of the belief that our ears lead our eyes to where the story lives. When you're designing sound on the film today, like Saving Private Ryan, you're bringing together a rich, complex orchestration of sounds. Then every film I've worked on with Steven Spielberg, he gives a gift of, here's a scene, Here's a moment, and I'm counting on sound to help tell the story. Here you go. What strikes me most about, especially the opening of Private Ryan, is that it was designed to use sound to tell a part of the story that it's not showing you. So. A scene like that fully takes advantage of how a soldier takes in war, which is a pretty narrow point of view. <laughs> Sound got to handle the scale of it. And we spent a lot of time on that first 25 minutes. It was weeks and weeks and weeks of just balancing all the sound effects that Gary and his crew provided. I kind of came up with like a certain pattern or rhythm of cutting these um, machine guns for the background battle. So that there was some form to this battle. 
There's a rhythm. There's always a rhythm. Even to chaos, there's a rhythm. The point of view is great for sound because it allows you to go inside the head. So I designed a sequence where when an explosion hits near Captain Miller, all the sound goes out. And that came from an actual veteran that told me that was how it affected him. So it put you deep inside his experience. If you look at it, it never has, until the battle is over, a wide shot, it gives you a grand scale, longest day style of, of D-Day. It doesn't do it, it's all very intimate. And, very importantly, there's no score. John Williams would have done a beautiful score. He would have had a whole different feeling. But without score, it um, tells you this is real. And the score comes in. The score is often used, I think of it as like a life raft. You have an emotional moment in the movie, and the score comes in. It just gives you something to hold on to. Different elements of sounds we use in movies, music, sound effects, and voice, are similar to the instrument groupings of an orchestra. But film sound work wasn't always like that. You know, with dozens of sound editors editing thousands of tracks. And it ultimately took people like Ben Burtt on Star Wars and Walter Murch on Apocalypse Now to get us to the full immersive soundtrack that the audience has come to expect in movies today. Created by a team of sound artists, a circle of talent. But when it all started, movies were silent. The invention of the phonograph was a truly monumental step for humanity. We could now capture sound forever. Edison originally developed the motion picture camera because he wanted images to go along with his phonograph. So the audio came first. But picture works at one speed, the sound is at another. And they had no way to put it in sync, which is why the whole project was abandoned. But they were just so eager to put sound to movies because everybody knew this would elevate the experience. Films were projected with a full live orchestra. They could be projected with people talking behind the screen. And there were actually people that traveled around doing sound effects live to silent films. There's films like Wings, when it was played in New York and its big premieres that had performers on stage doing live sound effects for airplane engines and using percussion instruments for the boom of artillery and explosions. They could do some wind, they could do some galloping horse hooves. There just wasn't technically a way of capturing and recording the sounds and attaching them to the movies yet. Until 1926, Warner Brothers did Don Juan with John Barrymore. And it actually had a synchronized music track, which was mechanically connected to a projector. But then in 1927, they actually recorded dialogue on the set. And so the jazz singer had spoken portions of it. Goodbye. Don't cry. Warner Brothers Theater in New York City, where the jazz singer is now playing, is sold out for many weeks in advance. What struck people most was L. Jolson's speaking voice, not even his singing voice, but that he spoke was revolutionary to audiences at the time, and that's what they wanted to hear. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. And of course, it was a gigantic sensation. So Hollywood was faced with what to do now. They had developed a way of shooting movies without sound, and that involved certain freedom on the set to be in a noisy place because it didn't matter. 
Suddenly there was this revolution where they had to start entombing the productions in sound stages, so all sound was blocked out from the outside world. All right, here we go. Quiet! Roll up! But the microphone's ranges were so short, the actors couldn't even move. She's got to talk into the mic. I can't pick it up. Don't you remember I told you? There's a microphone right there in the bush. It was very limiting. But even despite the limitations, audiences loved sound. And I think it's because even in the sound of a human voice, we carry emotion. Antonio. Nan! 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 He's alive! <laughs> but the addition of the voice was not the only thing that changed in movies at that time. Filmmakers began to realize that sound effects were also an important part of cinema. And they discovered that you don't get all the sound effects you want by just hanging a microphone out over the set. The sounds aren't there. So this is where slowly the idea of the sound editor evolved to add sounds after the fact. There's fire, there's explosions, there's barnyard animals. Cars and motorcycles. Different from buses, different from trains. With a little bit of wind in the background in this rain. As sound editors, we create a sound world independent of what got recorded at the time of shooting. but it isn't probably till you get to King Kong that you could actually call it sound design. Many of the techniques we use to manipulate sound today were pioneered on that film. The bulk of it is all about characters that don't exist. So Murray Spivak had to get creative to find the right sound. I went to uh, the Celic Zoo at the time. I got all the roars I needed. I then slowed those down to half speed. And I played the tiger growl backwards against the lion roar forward. And it gave me a sort of an uncanny roar. These sound design tricks are still in use today. And that was a big step forward. But Murray Spivak operated outside the system. He was locked away in the music department, and no one knew what he was doing. I think they felt that the studio would say, don't bother with all of that, if they knew the kind of effort he was putting into it. Because the studios had their own collections and their own stock sound effects, then they would repeat them. They wouldn't change them over the years. Each studio had its own ricochet and face punch and explosion. If they worked out successfully, they'd be kept and used over and over again. They were just expected to get something in there and it'd be on budget. But some of the biggest innovations in film sound actually had their roots in radio. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow, The Whistler, any of those shows were fun to listen to. And the sound brought it to life. Doors opening and closing, and footsteps. <laughs> Right in, honey. We'll go in the kitchen. Oh, it's not Marlo playing chef again. What is it this time? I can remember lying on the floor in front of the radio console. I thought, when I grow up, I'm going to make footsteps like that. Your imagination could dramatize what you were hearing. I just thought it was really great. You know, it was great for your imagination, great for your creative spirit, and so forth. 
And the innovator here was Orson Welles. He was very adventuresome in sound perspective. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, a hundred yards away. <sighs> and so when he did Citizen Kane, he brought those techniques in sound from radio to film. Rosebud. By being as aggressive spatially with sound as he was with his depth of focus on camera. Charlie, what time is it? 11.30. New York? Hmm? This idea that every space has its own signature the sound energizes the environment. Now in complete control of the government of this state. And you can use even very refined elements of reverberation to help you tell your story. But this was a new innovation for sound in film. The norm from the 1930s to the 1960s was to emphasize music over sound effects. Why don't you say it, you coward? You're afraid to marry me. You'd rather live with that silly little fool who can't open a mouth except say yes, no, and raise a parcel of mealy mouth bread, just like... Who person say things like that about mealy? Who are you to tell me I must? But if you run music all the time in the film, it has a cumulatively counterproductive effect. Constantly injecting steroids. <laughs> But if you want unrelieved tension, don't use any music at all. Hitchcock got the power of sound. He actually essentially dictated a sound script. And he really incorporated the use of the sound into the concept of the film. Hearing their breaths and feeling the impacts and the hits, it kept you very connected right with the characters. And I think that that was a scene where it worked really well, just having effects on their own. David Lean focused on sound. Stanley Kubrick focused on sound. but the studios weren't encouraging of that kind of thing. The Hollywood studio system often had a built-in approach to film sound that was controlled and traditional. That's a parallel to filmmakers maybe making the same kind of movies over and over again. Hello, talk. It was looked upon as like a factory. And that tends to restrict the adventuresomeness, especially in a studio environment. So the Hollywood films that I had seen as a kid growing up didn't make me want to become a filmmaker. My way of thinking, they were corporate creations. But when I was 10, I learned that there was such a thing as a tape recorder. And I understood intuitively what it did and how it did it. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. I would record from the radio onto the tape recorder and then cut the tape into pieces and then rearrange the pieces and scotch tape them in a different order than they were recorded and flip them upside down and play them backwards and hear what that sounded like. And then I came back from school one day and turned on the radio and I was disoriented for a moment because I heard something coming out of the radio that sounded like what I had recorded the day before. And it was a record made in France of musique concrète by Pierre Henri and Pierre Schaeffer. That 
was a revelation to me that there were people in the world, French people, doing what I was doing, and they were making records of it. And so I suddenly saw what I was doing had a broader application. I love Ingmar Bergman films at age 15, and I love Kurosawa because the imprint of the personality of these filmmakers was very strong. In 1963, I went to a university in Paris, studying for a year, right at the height of the new wave. I saw Jean-Luc Godard's film, Breathless, and I could tell that rules were being broken. And that got me excited. I got injected with the film bug and went to USC. I met Walter Murch in film school. He was a graduate student, I was an undergrad. It was very easy to make friends, and that was part of the fun of being there. And it was only when I got to film school that I realized that you have to do to sound in film the very kinds of things that I was doing with these random sounds that I recorded back in the early 50s. Walter was coming up with different sound ideas and running tracks backwards. Basically, that's all he was doing, was creating soundtracks. But it was an unusual time to go to film school because television was killing film. President Kennedy has been shot in Dallas, Texas. The 60s were a time when we were focused on what we saw on television and the news. I think it was the most powerful civil rights protest full of unrest and politics. Hollywood film felt a little out of sync. I want to hear nothing more about this troublemaker. It was actually rock and roll and musicians like the Beatles that were capturing culture's imagination. More than film. And that year was the absolute bottom of number of films produced in Hollywood. The model on which they had built their studios was not working anymore. There's not enough jobs. But kind of a life raft that was extended to us young film students was a fellowship by Warner Brothers, which George won. And George met the only other person on the lot who had a beard, who was Francis Coppola, who was directing Finian's Rainbow. We had both been film students, long hair. Everybody else on the crew was over 50. So at the end of Finian's Rainbow, Francis wanted to make a movie on his own called Rain People. And he said, do you know anybody who knows anything about sound? And I said, oh, I got the perfect guy, Walter Murch. Brain People is a road movie, much like Easy Rider. Our two guys in Easy Rider were traveling west to east. The Rain People was traveling the other way. So we built this truck and just went across the country making a movie. And it was the Niagara, which was smaller, lighter sound equipment, that actually started the ability to shoot movies on the street. If we can make a film out of a shoe store in Nebraska, why do we have to be in Hollywood? So we moved to San Francisco. Francis, George, and me were all in our late 20s, and we formed American Zoetrope. One of the dreams or goals of Zoetrope was to break down the barriers between picture editing and sound editing and sound mixing. Then I could let my music concrete demon out of the bottle completely, which was a whole new direction. 
So immediately after finishing the mix on Rain People, George and I got together to write the screenplay for THX 1138, and we got financing from Warners. And I would cut picture during the day, and then Walter would come in at night and cut the sound. I took it upon myself to record every sound effect for the film myself. THX had a very eerie, strange soundtrack. And based on the dismal performance of the film commercially, Warner Brothers canceled the development advance that they had made to Zoetrope. They claimed that this was a personal loan to Francis, and he owed them all this money back. The equivalent today would be three million. Bankrupt our company, made it so I couldn't work in the business for a while. It was the end of the road, as far as Zoetrope was concerned. And in that state, Francis was offered to direct this sleazy gangster film that 12 other directors had turned down, which was The Godfather. But he wanted to invest the film with the sensibility of the European film and art that had influenced all of us. And he pulled all of us into it. When I was the kid growing up, one of the composers who was doing the most advanced thinking at the time was John Cage. He was proselytizing that everything is music. Even the sound that the audience makes in the theater is music. And even the sound of the lid of the piano going down is a kind of music. He made us pay attention. So in The Godfather, the moment leading up to Salazzo's death, is accompanied by this screechy, John Cagey sound. What you're actually listening to are Michael's neurons clashing against each other as he's making the decision to actually kill these people. And the murder of a dream he had of having nothing to do with the family. It's not technically music, but it conjures up emotion and meaning. Obviously, it became a big hit and that bailed Zoetrope out. We were able to keep going after that. This one time, I'd like you to ask me about my affairs. But the soundtrack of The Godfather, as it was released in the theaters in 1972, was virtually identical to the soundtrack of Gone with the Wind, released in 1939. You will promise, won't you? It's a mono film with just a single speaker behind the screen. Is that, is that all, Ashley? So sound in film didn't really change. But contrast that with the music industry, which was adopting all of this new technology. Things like the LP, which by the late 1950s had stereo sound. Stereo spread the music across two different speakers. surrounding you and immersing you in the music. And the Beatles in particular were really testing the boundaries of the medium. I remember when I played Revolver, it was a visceral feeling. You could feel the sound in your body. Turn up your mind, relax and float downstream. In the song Revolution No. 9. Number 9. Number 9. George Martin brought this ability to mix and create sound design that would then be melded with rock and roll. Revolution number nine was fascinating to me because it was just like music concrete. As we come out of the, the hippie 60s era, uh, rock music, we brought that sensibility to cinema and thought, why can't movies be in stereo? And 
it was in that overheated environment that Dolby came along from the music industry in the mid-70s and took the lid off. Providing stereo sound in more and more theaters. But I remember a, a nameless film executive at one of the distributors in Hollywood who actually hit his desk and said, God damn it, he said, it's good stories and comfortable seats. That's what sells movies, not sound. But then in 1976, with the story is born, Barbara Streisand had the imagination to say, I want to do this vast stereo sound of my film and just to tell the studio if we're going to do it. That all-enveloping sound, and especially coming from the audiences, to involve you as an audience member into the concert. Leave a troubled past and I might start On A Star is Born, Barbara Streisand insisted on, and in fact got, an extraordinary amount of time to do the sound edit and sound mix. In fact, it was something on the order of magnitude of four months. At a time when it was more traditional to have seven weeks. The deal with first artists was that the artist was responsible for anything over six million dollars. I spent the six million dollars on the movie. But then when I got into sound, I spent another million dollars. Are you a figment of my imagination? Or I one of yours? When Warner Brothers saw the film, they liked it so much that they didn't make me pay the million dollars. I thought it was wonderful. I was willing to spend it. There's a degree of reality that you can get from stereo that's never possible with a mono soundtrack. And bless Barbara Streisand for recognizing the value. But it wasn't just the way films were played in theaters that was changing during this time. It was the way they were recorded, too. I was a teenager in the 70s, and I saw the film Nashville. And I think that was probably the film that turned my ears on to what was possible in a movie with sound. When they come into the airport, I mean, that's an incredibly beautiful piece of sound. There's airplanes that come in and out and obliterate what people are saying. There's a reporter on a microphone. There's a marching band. And thank you, Franklin High School Band. I think you kids get better every year. All right, twirlers, let's twirl! You're woven through that entire tapestry, and the sound is what's pulling you. The sound is what's telling you where you're going to go next. You know, Jim Webb obviously had, had worked with uh, Robert Altman on many of his films. He was the master of multi-track, just ahead of their time and pushing the limits. Before that, they recorded one track, but now we don't shoot two tracks or three tracks. We've got eight, 10, 16 tracks. You know, everybody had a mic. No matter how many people were in the scene, they all had microphones and they were all on mic all the time. All the other friends, members, and uh, the, some Chris, Paul the Herald, come on, he's falling somewhere down. It was amazing how the story was driven by the sound in a way that I don't think had happened before then in American films. My generation, you know, Francis and George and Marty and Brian and, and my whole group that I sort of grew up with, very sound conscious generation. So between the technological and creative advances of the early 1970s, sound was taking root in a new American renaissance of movies in a way that had never been heard before. Oh, I, I understand. But heading into the late 70s, even bigger breakthroughs were on the way. Most directors spend a lot of time with their cameramen and the actors. I just take the same amount of time and spend it also with the sound designer. But when I started my next film, Francis was doing the conversation and Walter was busy on that. 
So I called Ken Muir at the USC and said, do you have anybody else like Walter? And he said, yeah, I got somebody here. My mother tells me that as a toddler, I loved to act out to music, that if she put a record on, that I would not only dance around the room, but I would assume characters. I'd be a cowboy or I'd be some kind of pirate or something. But when I was about six years old, I had a serious illness and I was in bed for a few weeks and very weak. But my father had access to a tape recorder and he brought that home. I began recording television shows by putting the microphone up to the TV and recording the Saturday morning cartoons. There were two television stations and one of them had the Warner Brothers package of syndicated film. I love recording Errol Flynn movies in particular. They ran the Cagney gangster movies and Bogart films. So I got very familiar with the sounds of Warner Brothers' classic library. The other channel pretty much showed MGM. As the other children were developing a love for certain music, I was listening to explosions. <laughs> So I began collecting things I liked. And I'd seek after a movie just to record the battle scene and just listen to them. I think the thousands of hours I spent doing that as a kid, unknown to me, that was building up an inventory of how sound in movies was part of the experience. I started making my own little movies. And of course, in those days, you couldn't record live sound while you're shooting Super 8 films. But I could generate a soundtrack after the fact by taking sound effects I'd extracted from movies and television shows and putting them in my movies. I first met Ben Bird at USC Film School. We kind of were kindred spirits. Whereas a lot of the students were into all the Antonioni and the arty films, we kind of liked the traditional Hollywood fun films and serials. So we wrote this movie called Rod Flash Conquers Infinity. Ben and I dressed up in these knockoff Flash Gordon things that we got at an army surplus store in Hollywood. We were making a voyage to the planet extraneous. We discover a dinosaur. And of course we have a pretty girl in like a cape. And, and Ben did the sound on that one. So I was just finishing at USC Cinema, and Gary Kurtz, who had represented George Lucas, came down to school looking for a student interested in sound who they could mold into their own ways. I went out to the studio and met with the two of them. And they outlined the film they were going to make. They had artwork on the walls done by Ralph McQuarrie, concept art for the film. And I was astounded by what I saw. This was a film I always wanted to work on. This had spaceships and monsters and weapons like lightsabers. It was called Star Wars. So I leap at the chance, and the initial discussion was, would you like to help collect sounds for a Wookiee? This is still about a year away from principal photography. I put Ben on in the beginning because I, I knew I had to figure out a way of making these characters real. And I knew it depended on how we developed these languages. And that's what Ben spent the better part of a year doing. We were trying to find an animal 
that had enough vocal expressiveness in its sounds that we could use it for the wookie. So there was a young bear named Pooh, and we spent an afternoon with this bear in a pen, coaxing it to say different sounds. The way they got it to make sound was to show it bread. It loved bread. The bear would... And then you give him the bread, and then he'd be like... George wanted to know before they filmed the movie, how would the Wookiee sound? Well, you said it, Chewie. This is not the way that most filmmakers worked at that time. I knew the sound was part of the foundation of what the movie was going to be. So everything had to have been figured out way ahead of time. So I proceeded on to work my way through the screenplay of Star Wars. I read through it and made some notes, broke it down, and I realized there were hundreds of things in the script, from Darth Vader's breathing, and you had the Death Star, you had TIE fighters, and a whole library of things in there. I said, well, do you want sounds for the rest of these things as well? The answer was, yeah, sure, just, just, just spend some time. And so I operated out of my apartment for many months, coming up with expeditions to go out and gather sound. While George Lee was off in England, busy shooting the movie, I was still based in LA. He wanted me to go out and record real motors and real airplanes and real rusty doors. This hum of a projector, a buzzing sound behind the television set. I tried to go to factories and a scuba shop. I just started recording everything I could get my hands on. And to populate the universe of Star Wars with the sounds of things that we would hear as real. We didn't want to follow the conventions of science fiction that were current at the time, which was things like Forbidden Planet or War of the Worlds, using electronic music technology. We didn't use synthesizers or anything like that. We used real sound effects. So a year or so went by of me collecting, and when they returned from filming, I kind of got a note saying, well, take the tapes and deliver them to Northern California. They were doing the picture editing in George's house. So I started to cut my sound effects into the editor's cuts of the movie. But R2-D2 took a long time. There were many versions of that over months that were failures. You have to actually make him talk and make you understand what he's saying. And R2 had no mouth at all. Listen, listen, what are you talking about? We were very worried that it would be incomprehensible. What eventually happened was, as George and I were talking to each other, we would say, well, R2 comes up to this point in the movie and he kind of goes, and suddenly we realized we were talking with expressive sounds. They had the intonation of meaning. We were verbalizing a sound that worked for us. And that led down the road of doing just that. I could do a vocalization and play something on the keyboard. And you could sort of work two things together. What mission? What are you talking about? I've just about had enough of you. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. We were not sure that audiences would comprehend this at all, though. I didn't know. I was nervous as anybody would be. And I thought maybe this was probably the end. I'd go back and become a science teacher somewhere in the East. You gotta remember, my first film was a failure. I thought the ultimate honor would be if we could be invited to a Star Trek convention. I could sell t-shirts. Maybe we'd have a card table there with, you know, handout posters or something. That, to me, would have been the peak of my career. When the film was finished, Fox didn't really know what they had. And I, I sat in a meeting with a Fox executive, with Gary Kurtz, and the Fox executive said, 
Uh, we like your movie, Gary, but we think it's a sleeper. We think it's going to open very slowly. I sat in the Coronet Theatre in San Francisco for the opening show there, seven mil print. I was sitting actually in the middle of the audience, and this guy sitting next to me as the plane comes overhead. Two weeks later, there were lines around the blocks across the country waiting for Star Wars. The award goes to Mr. Benjamin Burt Jr. Thank you very much. I'd like to, of course, thank George Lucas, who had all the great ideas and provided all the inspiration for the things in Star Wars. Thank you very much. It is the imaginative director who will say, let's take the next step in the sound story. George Lucas and Gary Kurtz, Barbara Streisand on Star is Born, Francis Coppola, Stanley Kubrick. Those are the key players who will say, yes, I'll do this. Star Wars was a revolution. It was that soundtrack that changed everything. 1977. In people's minds, there was a time when sound was cool. And it created this era driven by the filmmakers. At that time, David Lynch and Alan Splett came out of AFI and were a partnership. These really great minds were doing experimental things. I believe the source of everyone's creativity comes from within. And Alan, he was a born sound man. Very interested in music, especially classical music. And he was a joyous experimenter. The trick for the human being is experiencing this deepest level of life. The unbounded, infinite ocean of consciousness at the base of all matter and mind, where sounds play a huge role in the abstract cinema. You want to bring people into a world and give them an experience and you could get lost in there for years. So it was in the air, breaking the mold and trying things that seemed crazy and seeing if they worked. In the 70s, it was a really good time of filmmaking. And there was no more experimental or chaotic film in all of history that so changed the way film sound was done and presented as Apocalypse Now. During the shooting of Apocalypse Now, Francis heard a record by Tomita, which was The Planets by Gustav Holst in four track. The idea was that you put speakers at each corner of your room and you sat in the center and you were surrounded by the music. Francis heard it and thought, this is how I want the film to sound. But all of us working on the sound, Richard Beggs, Mark Berger, and myself, we'd only worked in mono. None of us had even worked on a stereo film, let alone this whole new six-track surround format. We were exploring the unknown, going into this whole new continent where we move objects all the way around the theater, which had never been done before.
If you're breaking new ground, then people who are interested in new ground come because they want to participate in it, and more ground gets broken. I spent about half my time on Apocalypse in the Mix, sitting there watching Walter Murch and Mark Berger and Richard Beggs and Francis figure out what this movie was going to sound like. Working on Apocalypse Now was my film school. Ultimately, we wound up spending a year and a half editing the sound and nine months doing the mix, which is just unheard of. Just about everything that could possibly go right or go wrong did. The whole Apocalypse Now experience was like dropping acid. This is the end, beautiful friend. What you have at the beginning of the film is Captain Willard in his Saigon hotel room, hallucinating, regretting what he's done in the war. Everything that you see and hear is being filtered through his consciousness. decision is what allowed Walter to do what he did with the sound. To tell the story more from the point of view of this character in this crazy situation in Vietnam. Saigon. Shit. And it frames the whole movie. interesting sound is designed into the script and is designed into the scenes. And so I wrote out a script for the sound treatment of the film to guide the mix. Walter decided that it was more efficient if each editor be responsible for one whole layer of sound so that the helicopters were edited by one editor and the background voices were edited by another editor. Les Hodgson was in charge of atmospheres. Les Wiggins was in charge of munitions. Pat Jackson was in charge of the boat. So that there was a consistency. To treat each sound editor as the head of an instrument grouping in an orchestra. You are the lead violin. You are head of the woodwinds. You are head of percussion. You are head of the brasses. And as Chief is dying, Pat Jackson changed the pitch of the boat so that the boat sound is going down. I think the biggest lesson I learned from Apocalypse Now sitting there was figuring out from moment to moment what sounds to use and what sounds not to use. Those kinds of decisions are the essence of film. And the exhibitors, they're going to play the picture on our terms, with our sound, the way we want them to show it. The film did run in this six-track surround format. And as things have evolved over the next 30, 40 years, that format is now the ground standard of how you mix a film. The soundtrack is at least as important as the film. And the director of the soundtrack of the entire movie is Walter Murch. In a way, Walter Murch is the father of us all in this modern era of film sound. Apocalypse Now marked the culmination of over 50 years of film sound development, and its repercussions can still be felt today. But the next big challenge for sound was how to work in the crazy new digital world. I 
always thought that animation was such a visual medium. But when I started putting just the right sound effects, it just made it a thousand times better. February of 1986, we formed Pixar. And I'd been working on animating these desk lamps. And so it made this little one and a half minute short film called Luxo Jr. And of course we wanted Ben Burt to do the sound. But they told us he was busy. And they say, but there's this young guy that's been working with Ben. He's really, really good. Let's give this new guy a try. His name's Gary Reisner. But I want Ben Burt. I think all of my early opportunities were shows that people wanted Ben Burt. And that's how it works in the world, right? We like Ben Burt, please. He's not available. Who else you got? Now, Luxo Jr. was definitely a huge step forward for animation. And they had a very real look to them. And Gary kept looking at it going, I want to ground this in reality. I had this digital workstation called the Synclavier, where I could take real sounds, load them into the computer, and manipulate them on the keyboard. Like scraping metal. The screwing in of light bulbs. Harsh, boring sounds. And the springs. You record sounds, you don't know what they're going to be for, but they're interesting. And later on, you find little tidbits that have a little vocal quality. They're sad or happy. And next thing you know, he brought me down and he showed me the first pass of Luxo Jr. And the characters came alive. He crafted their voices, and he gave them weight. Gary got it. He took the medium of computer animation to new heights, and pretty much everything Pixar did, Gary did the sound for. I thought, this is cool. I'm part of something really big here. George Lucas and Ben Burt, Francis Copeland and Walter Murch, David Lynch and Alan Split. Great directors connected at the hip to a sound person. One of mine was with John Lasseter, and another was with Steven Spielberg. Action! Welcome to Jurassic Park. We're gonna make a fortune with this place. I think Gary Reitzman's greatest contribution to Jurassic Park was presuming what dinosaurs sounded like to make them extraordinary, but also natural. And the first time I ever heard the T-Rex, I did literally fall off my chair. Talk about innovative. It was just unbelievable the sound that he did on Jurassic Park. So we just asked him to do sound for us on the first computer anime feature film. You got a friend in me. I just appreciated how Gary was making sure that the sounds he used supported the emotional intention of the narrative of whatever was going on. Say, what's that button do? I'll show you. Buzz Lightyear to the rescue. Oh. Hey, Woody's got something like that. His is a pool strength. We wanted to have one thing that both Woody and Buzz had that you could tell Woody's was older and cheesier and Buzz's was new and high tech and that was a sound system. I had an old Casper doll. There's a record in there that he is, um, come on, Chris. See, that's like, I love you. <laughs> He's sounding awesome these days. Oh, come on, Casper. Reach for the sky. Gary loved that idea. We were innovating with computers so much and creating new tools for animation. And therefore, he was at the same time kind of really using computers for the first time in really clever ways to do sound design. You know, it's mind-blowing to think that just, I don't know, even many people around the industry were still cutting sound at that time on NAG. 
Up until the early 1990s, we were cutting one track of sound at a time on mag film. But by the mid-1990s, sound editing migrated to computer systems like Pro Tools. Now we could see the waveforms we were editing, but more importantly, sound editors could finally hear how all their tracks played together. It was a very exciting time for all people in visual and sound. So all of a sudden I get this call. <laughs> the Wachowskis said, you remember that really great script called The Matrix that we used to talk about on the mixing stage? It's greenlit. And the fact that the movie was about this digital reality that was coming through wire, I thought there was some parallel to trying to do all of the sound design in the digital world. And it was a chance to apply this technology that was still sketchy, but allowed for all these possibilities. Like one of the first sounds that I developed was the sound of Neo perceiving himself being digitized. Did you? In the digital world, everything is zeros and ones, it's just little boxes, basically. I wanted to get that feeling across to the audience, the jaggedness. Computers did allow to do some very fun, creative work on the Matrix. There would not have been time otherwise. And I've always had a love-hate thing with technology. Computers oh, yeah. suck. You know, part of me just wants to live in the woods, you know, and, and carve sticks. I have seen the future. This is it. It definitely does not work. But another part of me just loves all these fancy tools. These days, there's so many tools to manipulate a sound that now, pretty much in sound, if you can think it, you can do it. But ultimately, it wasn't about the technology. It's the contribution of dozens of sound people, a circle of talent who collaborate behind the scenes to help tell the story. The human voice, you know, it's the great possession of the individual that can have all sorts of nuances. That's unique. If you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. When you're recording production sound, what you're really trying to capture is the performance. You have my permission to die. People's voice is a really complex instrument. With a boom microphone, you're about maybe 10 inches away from a person's mouth. It's an enormous sense of intimacy that you get. I remember on Funny Girl, we filmed it to a pre-recorded track. Oh, Willie leans towards me and he says, what do you think? And I said, it could be better. Because I believe in working in the moment. I have to do it live. And he said, okay. So they put a boom like this because it had to be close up. When I know I'll come back. On my knees someday. For whatever my man is, I am his. Forever more. And I thought, yeah, that's the kind of feeling I'd like to get into my man. As a director, I can hear the truth. When an actor is indicating something or feeling it. What are you, a demon? I'm not, you know. You me. spit on the Torah! I love the Torah! You spit on it! to spit on everything, on everyone, on nature itself, in God's face, in my face, in Adassa's face. As a production sound mixer, one film that I'm very proud of is a film that Patty Jenkins directed. It was called Monster. It was about the serial killer, Eileen Warnes. You don't have to do this. Get down. You don't. We captured every little really don't. breath. Oh. oh, God, my wife. 
<laughs> my wife, my daughter's having a baby. Oh, God. Oh, God, I'm sorry. That was one of those moments where literally the hair stood on the back of your neck at the end of the performance. But just all those things that you battle as a sound mixer, you're dealing with wind, that is never our friend. And there's many, many things that are required for things to look right on camera that are noisy. And if you're hearing those, that takes you out of the story. That's why we edit the dialogue. My mom is Kay Rose, and she was the first woman to win an Oscar for sound. She could hear clicks and pops that shouldn't be there, take it out, fill it with ambience, and be very smooth. Ordinary People was a movie my mom and I worked on. And it was one of the hardest sound jobs we've ever, ever done. The movie is about a family affected by the death of their older son. The surviving son goes to a psychiatrist. Uh, hi, yeah, come in. It's OK, they all do that. And they chose an aluminum warehouse near an airport. Jared. For these very intimate scenes with the psychiatrist. Which was awful. I had a fairly strong idea about sound, but I had not directed a film before. So I needed help. And she did just a great job. It took weeks to try to get out the little clicks and pops in planes. Boating accident? For 10 you? minutes of production dialogue. Weeks. You want to tell me about it? The silence was meant to illustrate pain. The disconnect between people. You can go upstairs to that room of yours and clean out the closet. Because it really is a mess. The dialogue department, we're the queens of the soundtrack. Jig, my jig. Everything falls apart without it. It's the thing that everything has to work around. And you don't want to lose a moment in a film saying to, you know, your friend, you know, what did he say? That's why sometimes we need to shoot ADR. <sighs> ADR stands for Lillian! Automated Dialogue Replacement. <gasps> it's dialogue that's re-recorded in a sound studio. Good. You pick out some lines that might be really low to hear. The actors have to come in, re-record, and then we as editors have to cut it to try to match those people's mouths. So Beth Bergeron hired me on A League of Their Own. One of the scenes that I cut was when Tom Hanks is yelling, There's no crying in baseball! Her crying on the set crying? was actually really kind of soft. No. Are you crying? Are you crying? And so in order to get her crying again, you had to get Tom Hanks as well. Hey, 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 hey! Because they're overlapping each other. All right, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> Rogers Hornsby was my manager, and he called me a talking pile of pig shit. So that way, when they mix, they can then bring up her crying when they need to. Did I cry? No, no. No, because there's no crying in baseball. I loved working on that film. But our job is also to add the background people, and that's what we call group ADR. Most people might not realize that that whole opening of Argo, you know, the assumption is, oh, that's all recorded on set. But the truth is, all of that's reconstructed. We had over a hundred Farsi-speaking Persian extras. We were miking the crowd from right in the middle of it, and from behind windows, from the rooftops. 
after a few hours of this, everyone was like hugging and a few people were crying. And we found out that uh, some of our voice talent had actually lived through the revolution. And all of that emotion that we were recording, it became part of the DNA of the scene. When people ask me about working on Selma, I, I tell them it's the, the first film that I've worked on that really meant something. When they're on the bridge, they're running for their lives so they don't get killed. You want the audience to feel the pain. <laughs> When I had people running by the mics, it's more real because it's got movement, it's got cloth movement, it's got feet. They're turning their heads and they're doing efforts. And so it just sounds more real. It was so important to me to work on this film. It allows me to relive some of the things as I was a child. It speaks to what people went through, what we're still going through today. I'm just really proud that I was able to work on it. But surrounding the voices in the movie is a whole world of sound effects created and cut by the sound editors. And it consists of three distinct parts. I got hired to do Top Gun with George Waters. So I spent a week in San Diego recording jets with John Vassal. But the jets themselves are not that interesting. They sounded kind of wimpy. So I created a library of mostly exotic animal roars lions and tiger roars and monkey screeches. And that wound up being the thing. It gave them a cutting, sharp feeling. And it's the single most labor-intensive editing process I've ever experienced. It took forever, which the studio was very frightened by and didn't understand. So at one point in the middle of this process, there was an executive from the studio. He came over to fire me. And he said, this movie isn't about the sound. But months later, we were nominated for an Academy Award. And I will say that he sent me flowers. And the note said, I guess it was about the sound. <laughs> She's also a civilian contractor, so you do not salute her. But you better listen to her. People who say, well, you know, it's a big action war movie. It's all yours, Charlie. Okay. A guy should do the sound. It's like, why? Has he been in a war? This idea of one gender being better at it than another, I think is kind of silly. It's experience. You're sitting in front of this big piece of equipment, and it looks very complicated and technical. And it's sort of that thing, like you peek your head into the cockpit, and there's all that equipment. It's like, ooh, you want to have some big guy who looks like he was in the Air Force in there, because, you know, if anything goes wrong, that person will get a screwdriver, I don't know. Because the job consists of, you know, pushing little buttons and turning little knobs, and that's not particularly a macho endeavor at all. But if you don't see anybody like yourself doing something, then that doesn't seem like a place you could fit in.
Foley is a subset of sound effects. We're called Foley artists. And truly what we do is custom sound effects. We're really like performers getting into their mindset. We really give them character. It's that detail that you don't really think about that makes it come alive. There's a very famous story where Jack Foley heard the director of Spartacus bemoaning the fact that the armor they were wearing sounded like tin pots. They were saying, we have to go back over and reshoot the picture at huge cost. Jack said, wait a second. He runs out to his car, he grabs some props, some big set of keys, et cetera, et cetera, comes in and works his magic. Which is kind of fun, because that's what Foley really is for us, magic. And the last subset of sound effects are ambiences. Atmospheric beds of sounds that editors lay underneath everything else. I think in any film like Lost in Translation, building the, the world and the atmosphere, the sound is such a big part of it that you don't realize until you're working on it. Picking up all those little details and adding these layers that makes, I think, you feel like you're really there. There's this whole other world that it brings. That's really half the movie. It's a bed of sound in the scene that sets you in that environment. It could be traffic. A bit of cricket. The sound of the room. or birds. It has to be evocative. When I was 11 years old, I had a mild case of polio. So as a reward for getting better, my mom drove me to Yosemite National Park. Once I went through that tunnel and it opened up and I saw Half Dome and El Capitan, I said, well, this is, this is it for me. I don't want to look at this, I want to be in it. The sound of those falls rushing past me as I climbed up. The power of water. I like to use that in film. I was working on a river runs through it, and the sound designer just said, look, I just need you to go out and record sounds. I knew every stream within 100 miles when I heard it back in the film, I could feel the moisture of the stream and I could hear the presence of this volume of air. That hit me so heavily. I thought to myself, this is me with my father fishing as an eight-year-old boy. It, it brings me to a really peaceful, important time. Everything has emotion, and therefore spirit. Aang really wanted the wind to have its own character in this movie. Wind sound was very impressive for the characters. How much they're quiet about their feelings. how much repression they endure.
that's the art of sound that ability to interpret expressively things that are happening and the final element of the soundtrack is music it has a direct connection to emotion The great thing about music is it's there that you as an audience can connect on a human level. It has a way of inviting you in. The way in which he records them, the way in which they're executed is extremely lavish and uh, epic really. I love that Hans doesn't give up, and he just keeps trying to make it better and better and better and better. He's obsessed. Look who's here. I think the heart has to come first, and then the intellect will follow. Your job is to come up with the unimaginable for them. Think about people's favorite movie moments, and it's usually a score element. Black Panther was set in Africa, and music is so important, setting that up. So my composer, he was the first person I called. When I write music for any of his projects, I'm always pushing myself to another kind of level. Music is what ties the whole thing together. experimenting in contemporary music, but also not being scared to bring in the classic, really heroic theme. And how do we tie that together in one consistent piece of music? We're gonna write something new, we're gonna create something completely different. And then we watched it, it was like, man, this is perfect. three minutes what a really great movie needs hours to do. It's the collaborative effort of all those people that make that soundtrack what it is. And the very last step is to provide that to the sound mixing stage. Re-recording mixing is a key component of film sound. You take all the elements from the sound editors and you finally bring them together like a conductor would. You may turn up the music to enhance the emotion. You may turn up the sound effects to add a visceral punch. Or you may turn them both down to focus on a line of dialogue. I'm glad it's you. Mixing also involves thinking about where sounds are placed on the screen and how they move. We use this panning technique everywhere in Roma. Like what components could go from that side to that side, left, center, right. Have the voices move that way when the camera pans that way. Alfonso was constantly trying to get us to keep things moving. The drum is filled with a lot of foreground background sounds. The film is very oral. There, is a lot of so there are a lot of sounds going on. The dance between the elements is what I consider cinematic. <laughs> the 
this is what the core of mixing is, is taking all these components, creating a, a place for them all. So it's just really building the track slowly, having everything play harmoniously. At one point you go, okay, we got a movie. It sounds like a movie. And when you feel those goosebumps, then you've done it right. The circle of talent is a collaborative group of people that spend hours and hours and days and days in the trenches that are doing all the work. And if people have to try and find meaning in what they do, it's the group of people that you're working with. But it's easy to lose sight of that. Because I had public success so quickly in my career, you come to work every day thinking you're an Oscar-winning genius. Thank you very much. But you can't put that kind of pressure on yourself that each time you do something, it's going to shake the world. And it, it led to a, a nervous breakdown. It finally came one day. I just couldn't work anymore. I was just sitting at the console crying to myself. Didn't know why. It was because I had invested too much in it. To be honest, one of the main things I would always try to do is get home for dinner with my family and I have to appreciate my wife Peggy and on all the years she's dragged me back out of my world of make-believe. Don't lose your foot. Plant it in something outside. Those are good things. You kind of get to the point where you realize that you want to be happy doing the work you're doing, that the, the pleasure is on what happens on a daily basis. You come in on a any given Tuesday, and you're working with making pass-bys out of bicycle rattling. If you can enjoy that and, and see that for what it is for a daily task, um, then that's where the pleasure will lie. I love what I do. It's very tedious, it's very time-consuming, but when I can play something back and I can feel it, I was like, oh man. You know, it's just, it's like really satisfying. I just couldn't believe I was getting paid real money to have so much fun. <laughs> I always say, you know, I would hate to have a real job. Pinch myself every day. Even in my early sound career, I remember how magical it felt to me. Movies were a place to have emotion that was safe. Of all the ways, all the things I can do in movies or have done in movies, sound is still the best way to experience emotion working on a movie to me. So the creation of the sound film made sound an art form. It's been very valuable in the evolution of humans' relationship to the the cosmos. The work you all do make massive contributions to the telling of the story. <laughs> and I love all your cleverness and ingenuity. And I love the sense of fun. And it makes these moments eternal. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? Me, me, oh. Come on, man!